These lessons introduce the types of variables we can study as linguists who are doing dialectological work and describe some of the historical origins of dialectology, some of the problems that we encounter historically in dialectological work, and some of the modern approaches to dialectology that in some cases address some of those problems and in other cases are still working through them. Dialectology is arguably the original field of linguistics and certainly fields like sociolinguistics and sociophonetics have their origins in dialectology. We do dialectology for a number of reasons. First, we like to make maps. So we like to see the ways that people are speaking in different areas, different parts of countries, different countries, different areas within smaller regions, within uh, various geopolitical boundaries. We do dialectology to establish an empirical baseline for other kinds of studies. So if we want to know how language is changing in an area, we first need to know how people are speaking in an area historically or at the moment. Moment, so we can see how change goes from there. We do dialectology to document the spread of languages and the spread of changes in languages and language varieties. Um, we look at specific variables that might not be studyable through other means, through dialectology. And finally, we want to use dialectology to provide an empirical foundation for studies and theories of linguistics that emerge from more theoretically oriented fields. In other words, there's a strong generative syntactic tradition, traditionally in linguistics, at least since Chomsky in the 1950s, uh, that's based on the work of a linguist or, or a respondent to a linguistic questions, uh, thinking about their own intuitions. Dialectology provides us an empirical way to test the theories that we generate from linguistics and a way to test the theories that we generate about how language is working and how language is changing. We conventionally categorize linguistics according to six domains, which apply across all linguistic disciplines and subdisciplines. These are uh, phonetics and phonology, sciences of sound, morphology and syntax, sciences of grammar, and semantics and pragmatics, sciences of meaning. In the UK, we also treat discourse studies as a domain of linguistics, but we'll leave that to the side for now. Dialectology has worked across its history in each of these domains, but at varying levels of success. And that's because different domains of linguistics are differently able to be studied through traditional dialectological methods. As we'll see as we move into the field, the, the work of dialectologists has continued to expand and try to innovate and try to improve ways that we could study. Very broadly speaking, though, the history of dialectology has first been to prioritize lexical items and then then dialectology has been found to be amenable to study sound systems, then from there, grammar systems, and right now some of the frontiers in dialectological work are in the fields of meaning in semantics and pragmatics, which is, is, for reasons we'll see, a very tricky domain to study. As we go through these, we can see sort of a progression from the easiest things to study with the most traditional dialectological methods to the most difficult things to study that require the most innovative methods. The most traditional kind of dialectological work looks at lexical items uh, and typically does it by asking an informant a question about a word and then uh, recording the word that they use, which is indicative of what word people use for that thing in that area. Uh, so you see the most traditional type of implementation of that sort of research. Here on this slide, uh, a researcher asks an informant, what do you call a small piece of wood stuck under the skin? And on the left, you see results to that uh, from the 19th fifties were a variety of terms uh, across uh, regions that were studied under the survey, the, study, the survey of English dialects, uh, return results like uh, splinter in the south uh, and spelk in the far north. On the right, you see a more recent implementation of that by Adrian Lehman and his colleagues, uh, where you see now a, a leveling of the dialectological term to a supra-regional uh, term splinter, uh, which has only failed to be replaced in uh, like Tyneside and uh, some areas around the Scottish border with Spelk. Uh, similarly, uh, you, you see this, the same sort of uh, survey item for the question, what do you call the season after summer? Uh, and on the left, you have the survey of English dialects resp responses, uh, where back end is, is the majority term in the north and autumn is the majority term in the south. And there's a transitional area. And then on the right, with the English dialect app, you see that autumn has become the normal term uh, throughout the UK. I've done some of this lexical research in the area of the United States where I used to work. Um, 
Conventionally, in the United States, if you have a numbered highway, you refer to that as highway and then the number, for instance, Highway 24. Uh, in the area I was working, Kansas City, um, some people refer to this uh, the, the roads in this way as the number and then the highway. So rather than Highway 24, the local uh, lexical item might be 24 Highway. Um, the area where I was working, uh, Kansas City, there's, there's the city itself, which is the darker space, and then the general urban area, which is built up, which is all the, the gray spaces plus Kansas City. Traditionally, uh, well, as a matter of fact, there is a river that runs through the, the middle of the community, and traditionally that would have been a major barrier to movement and contact across uh, the region because it was difficult to cross the river. Of course, that's not meaningful anymore because people have cars and we have bridges across the river. However, when I surveyed this item and asked people uh, in a, a physical dialect survey uh, how they referred to a numbered highway, whether they lived north or south of the river was actually a significant predictor. So south of the river, people were much more likely to say 24 highway rather than highway 24. And north of the river, people were more likely to use the standard highway 24 rather than 24 highway. Um, we also see these uh, types of lexical surveys at the national level. So uh, this is from Lebovash and Boberg's uh, Atlas of North American English, and they ask people the term for carbonated beverage. And you see uh, these boundaries, which we'll refer to later as isoglosses. The red area uh, is the Coke isogloss, the green area is the pop isogloss, and the blue areas are areas where they call a carbonated beverage soda. Um, Tragically for us, uh, there are no fizzy drink areas in the United States. So what each of these does is they look very simply at lexical items, what word people use uh, for a thing in a particular area, and then try to carve out what those areas are. We can sort of move up one level still within the domain of lexical items to look at how people pronounce particular words. So this is sort of a boundary area between lexis and sound, but we still categorize it as, as a study of lexical elements because it's not uh, a matter of systematic sounds throughout their entire phonetic or phonological system, but as particular words and how they're produced. So again, we see uh, this kind of lexical sound work. How do you pronounce a word uh, in the recent English dialect app work on uh, how you pronounce this, this particular pastry? Uh, does uh, that word rhyme with gone or cone? So do you say scone or scone? Uh, and here we get this, uh, this, this mapping that shows that, that uh, uh, Scon is, is clearly the preferred majority term uh, in the north and in Scotland, and then uh, Scone becomes increasingly well established, especially around Manchester. It's gaining some currency apparently in the south, and then in, in uh, Republic of Ireland, uh, Scone is, is clearly the preferred term. Uh, the Atlas of North American English uh, looked at this sort of lexical variation uh, dialectologically in the word roof, uh, the, the thing on top of your house, which regionally in the United States can be either roof or roof. Uh, and the red line shows the roof isogloss. The blue areas are places where roof is the common term. So we still categorize those items where it's one word or one small set of words and we're asking how those are produced. The next level up, and this is where we start to transmit, transition into the domain of phonetics, is where we look at how entire classes of a phone are pronounced. Uh, so in this case, this work from the Atlas of North American English is examining the Canadian shift. The Canadian shift is, is a series of systemic changes in the vowel qualities of the front short vowels in American Englishes. So this is especially the vowels in words like kit, dress, and trap. Uh, and in the Canadian shift, these vowels uh, do what we'll refer to as we move on in this term. Uh, they retract and lower or back and lower. So the result of that is the trap vowel has a quality that's more like uh, the bath vowel in English. The dress vowel has a quality that's more like trap, and the kit vowel has a quality that's more like dress. So kit sounds more like ket, dress sounds more like dress, 
and trap sounds more like trop. Um, now importantly here, these changes affect the entire system of these vowels. So anytime you have a word with dress in it, that eh vowel, pet, uh, fed, dress, whatever, it's affected by this sound change and the entire system of these vowel qualities change. So in this particular study, uh, Lebovash and Boberg have looked at the qualities of these vowels uh, and uh, found that it's most predominant, as the name would suggest, uh, in this populated area of Canada. Uh, and, and other studies that uh, we may get to this term have also found that this is a widespread sound change across a much broader area of North America, uh, in, including the area where I worked. Now we call this a phonetic shift because what this is looking at is the quality of particular vowels. Uh, so speakers have the same number of vowel or consonant segments in their phonological inventory. It's just the way that they are producing that vowel or that consonant has changed. We can move a further level up in abstraction and in our domains of linguistic inquiry and move to phonological studies by examining how many sounds speakers actually have in their inventories. So in the study of the Canadian shift, speakers pronounced these vowels differently, but they still had the same number of vowels uh, as speakers in other regions. They just sound different. If we look at actually how many vowels or consonants speakers have in their inventories, then we're getting into the domain of phonology, how many sounds are actually stored in speakers' minds uh, and in the language of that sound system. So obviously a very prominent and well-known phonological issue in English Englishes uh, occurs with the vowels in words like strut and foot. Uh, and that's what's being studied here in this, this result from the English dialect app uh, where people are asked to pronounce the vowel putt. Uh, and in the 1950s write-up, uh, the way that this has been backwards reconstructed by the, the recent data, uh, the survey of English dialects suggests that people uh, in a large area of the North and the Midlands that goes, that goes well below Coventry, uh, speakers use one vowel in both these words. So their inventory doesn't have distinct strut and foot vowels, but actually there's just one uh, vowel with the quality of foot. And so all words across both of these vowel categories will be perceived and produced as the same vowel. Uh, and, and then by contrast, we, we see a relatively small area in the south and west of England where there are two distinct vowels. Uh, the updated uh, survey map work uh, done through the English dialect app uh, suggests that the two vowel system is becoming much more common. So we still have uh, an area around Manchester where people are, are are firmly within that one vowel system, but a much larger area of Scotland, the south of England, Wales, uh, and uh, of course big parts of the Midland where there are now two vowel systems. So importantly, this is dialectologically telling us something about a change in local phonologies. A two vowel system from the south is spreading and taking over a previous one vowel system of the north. Uh, a parallel study in whether there's a length distinction in a word like last. Uh, so again, in the um, uh, 50s survey of English dialect work, there's pr pr predominantly a one vowel system in the north and a two vowel system where there was a length distinction rule uh, in the south. And in the app-based work of, of the uh, recent years, uh, the, the two vowel system, the length distinction, uh, has been spreading and becoming more normal throughout the country. Um, we can also, of course, see this kind of phonological work happening in consonants. Uh, so again, a very well-known uh, study is the merger of the sound th, as in uh, thought, uh, and the sound f, as in um, fleece, uh, where they're both produced with that uh, uh, labiodental th sound, so that three and free sound the same, usually being pronounced as free. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, this merger where the two, vow the two consonants, the th and the fa, uh, that distinction is lost and they become just one merged 
the consonant that was highly concentrated to London. Uh, the 2016 app-based work shows that that uh, merger is, is spreading regionally across England, well into Scotland, and, and even with, with some uh, incursion into Northern Ireland. Uh, finally, we see uh, in this work the loss of R as a consonant uh, throughout England. So in the 1950s, uh, Rlessness, so this is whether or not words like start, nurse, force, north, whether the vowel in those has an R-like quality. Um, and in the 1950s, uh, R-lessness uh, was, was a London system, but was also widespread throughout Manchester and parts of the north. But R-fullness uh, was being retained in the west of England, as well as around Liverpool and up into Newcastle. And as the work on the right shows, uh, by 2016, England has become almost entirely R-less. Uh, deviating from uh, the R fullness of some parts of Scotland, but definitely of Ireland and, of course, of uh, American Englishes as well. These different uh, levels of phonetic and phonological analysis can be combined to do very complex work. Uh, so in the North American Atlas of North American English, which I've, I've cited a few times, uh, they combine the different phonetic studies and different phonetic patterns with phonological inventories and use that to come up with dialect maps. So we say that on the basis, for instance, of Canada having the Canadian shift as well as the low back vowel merger, which gets rid of the distinct among vowels like uh, the vowels in lot, cloth, and thought. Uh, in, in Canada, there's, there's predominantly only one vowel among that set. Um, that phonological change plus the phonetic change involved in the Canadian shift gives us a way to categorize Canada as a dialect area that's separate from other dialects in North American Englishes. The next level up is to begin looking at grammar. Um, and there's been less work in this for reasons that will become clear as we, we continue to work. But the, the short version is, um, as we move along the continuum of variables, it's easier to elicit items at the lexical uh, and phonetic and phonological level than it is items at the morphosyntactic and semantic pragmatic levels. Um, uh, a survey item like this, which is also from, from some work that I did in the United States, uh, this surveys whether a speaker can, can do preposition stranding, so put a preposition at the end of a clause, which of course is uh, traditionally prescriptively banned in Englishes, uh, whether that's allowed in a question like, do you want to come with? Um, this sort of represents, again, a transition from lexical items to uh, syntactic items. Uh, come with could be limited just to that construction. And in that case, it would be at the lexical side where it's, it's limited to a particular construction. Uh, or it could generalize to a broader allowance for preposition stranding, maybe just with, as in, uh, do you want to go with, do you want to be with, uh, do you want to talk with, uh, or it could extend more, more generally across the system. Uh, in this case, uh, do you want to come with appears to be a change in progress. So older speakers largely rejected the construction, uh, and then speakers, uh, we, can, we can look further at kind of the middle bracket of speakers, and there, uh, speakers who are over 25 were more likely to reject. And then we can go further and see that really young speakers are very likely uh, to accept, and then I actually found in this study a county by county difference uh, with more urban communities being more likely to accept do you want to come with and more rural counties uh, being less likely. So we find a change in progress as well as something that's regionally constrained according to the, the sort of regional dialectological work. We can also move into a deeper level uh, and, and in this case, uh, the Atlas of North American English is looking at a variable called positive anymore. Uh, traditionally, the word anymore has to occur at the end of a clause and has to occur as a negative polarity item, which means that it needs the sentence to be negative in order for that negative polarity item to be used grammatically. So all Englishes have a sentence like, I don't want to do that anymore as grammatical. For some regions of American English, you can also use any more without this negative polarity item. So you could say, I definitely want to do that anymore, and it means something like nowadays, and that's different from the way that it used to be. So Lebov, uh, Ash and Boberg surveyed this in their Alice of North American English, and in this case, the red 
uh, dialect area, the red isogloss shows places where positive anymore was judged to be acceptable. Now again, this is kind of at that transition space uh, between a lexical item, so one exception to the negative polarity item inventory of American Englishes, but it also expands to a broader look at semantic conditioning. Uh, so this is, is work that I did with positive anymore, and I, I look not just at responses, but actually productions of positive anymore on Twitter, and broke that down according to the syntax that was actually licensing or not licensing positive anymore. So now looking across the entire clause structure at how frequently people used anymore in conventional sentences like I don't want to do that anymore, questions like uh, should we go there anymore, um, questions with uh, 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 an adverb uh, or an adversative verb like I refuse to do that anymore or I rarely do that anymore uh, and then down to more uh, more nominal and more questionable cases that that would be more likely to vary things like it's hard to do that anymore I hate that anymore or I'm really happy with that anymore uh, and what I found was variation by region with the area that LeBeau, Ash, and Boberg pointed to as the positive anymore showing higher instance of production of positive anymore across all these different contexts than other areas of the country. So this suggests a change across the syntax, across the clause structure uh, of NPI licensing in the case of anymore, and not something that's just limited to uh, this, this whether or not people can use it. It's variable across the syntactic system. Uh, and indeed, I found that this was, was actually variable intra-regionally as well as uh, between the area where the Atlas of North American English said that this term was possible and the areas where it didn't. Uh, so in this case, uh, this uh, conditional inference tree, which we'll actually work from quite a bit as an expedient to looking quickly at qualitative data, uh, breaks apart the Midland communities, and these are the areas where the Alice of North American English said that positive anymore should be used. And what this found is that the areas farthest to the east, Pittsburgh, and then you move to the west a bit to Columbus and Indianapolis, were different from the areas to the west of the Midlands, Kansas City and St. Louis, and then all these together were different from all the, the, the non-Midland areas, Birmingham in the deep south, Chicago in the far north, and San Francisco geographically about as far to the west as you can get in the United States. So this reveals with this fine-grained syntactic analysis uh, differences in regionally in the United States where the syntactic variable clearly is a marker of a particular dialect region within the uh, national geography of the United States and the continental uh, dialect geography of North America, but also intra-regionally there are fine-grained differences in the productions of the syntactic feature that get down to the level of the broader syntax of the clause. Finally, the most uh, challenging and newest area of work in dialectology is to look at uh, pragmatic markers and discourse markers. Uh, so, so this is some very recent work uh, from, from Ilbury that's going on uh, that he's doing down at Queen Mary to look at A as a discourse particle in uh, multicultural London English speech, uh, doing very complex work to categorize, to count every time that occurs, and then to categorize the type of discourse pragmatic work that is being done with this. Um, and, 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 and finding you know, these, these very fine-grained patterns uh, of A being used, especially for the discourse role of an insult, uh, and then much less in, in sort of uh, banal statements and exclamations like A, A, A. Um, interactional features like this are, are, as I've said, the newest area of study, especially at the level of highly rigorous empirical and quantitative studies like what have become pretty firmly entrenched for other domains like uh, um, phonetics and phonology. Some of the more qualitative tradition of this work would look at politeness strategies uh, in, in, in the sense of Brown and Levinson and, and, and Beholden to Grice, or some of Tannen's qualitative work in things like high and low involvement cultures, uh, considerateness cultures, and, and high and low context cultures. Um, 
more recent empirical work is uh, ongoing in, in Hilton's uh, PhD work, uh, as well as in discourse particles, besides what I cited, uh, Pickler's 2016 book has a number of new and innovative studies that are looking at interactional features. By far the most studied feature in this kind of dialectological interactional discourse pragmatic work is the discourse marker like, uh, but increasingly work is pushing in this direction. Um, but as, as again, I, I think we'll see, this is, is a hard area to work in and we're continuing to develop methodologies that are able to deal with it. Um, I would also point you toward uh, Yulia Boldis's uh, Warwick thesis of 2020 as uh, excellent work. She looked at uh, uh, Na as a discourse particle in Romanian uh, and, and that's the sort of dialectological work that, that is innovating the field to be able to look at, at these domains of uh, linguistics that have traditionally been inaccessible to dialectological work.